All right. Let's close this out. Oh, I lost my slide, so there we go. Okay. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So this is our introductory lecture for historical theology. And so this first lecture, I'm going to be talking through really identifying what historical theology is uh, between biblical theology, systematic theology, and then ultimately we'll kind of get into the, the material of what we're looking at, and I'll cover that as I finish off the introduction. So, <clears throat> so first slide. What is historical theology? Historical theology is the discipline that studies the interpretation of Scripture and the theological formulation of the church in the past. In other words, it asks, how has the church in the past interpreted the Bible? How has the church formulated and ex expressed its theology? This is the one thing that you're going to struggle with as you're watching me is that I'm not good on slides. I forget them, so here we go. <laughs> so think of historical theology as wisdom from the past. It is wisdom about what constitutes the valid interpretation of the Bible and what constitutes sound theology. It's a theolo theological tradition that guides us. Now, this is a fairly straightforward definition, but it raises some important questions to ask, such as, uh, what is tradition? What is tradition? How does wisdom from the past relate to the authority of Scripture? If Scripture is primary, then how does tr the tradition guide and shape our beliefs? What is the difference between historical theology, biblical theology, and systematic theology? And why does any of this matter in the first place? So we're going to take a closer look at that. So what is tradition? Well, we'll start by clarifying what we mean by tradition. It is helpful to think of tradition in two ways, with an uppercase and a lowercase. So an uppercase tradition and tradition lowercase is a huge distinction between the two. So first we're going to look at tradition with a capital T. Tradition with a capital T is the form of divine revelation often associated with the Roman Catholic Church. It consists of the oral communication, Jesus, oops, Jesus, uh, sorry about that, Jesus gave his apostles who orally taught their successors who were the bishops of the early church. It's a kind of literal passing of Jesus' words from successive generations of church leaders. So I have two examples to look at to kind of help, help explain what I mean by this. So the first example comes from 1854, and that year Pope Pius IX declared the Immaculate Conception of Mary. He stated that when Mary was conceived in the womb, she bore no guilt from Adam and had no corruption in her nature. She was born without sin and lived her entire life without sin. The second example comes from 1950 when Pope Pius XII, different guy, same name, different guy, proclaimed the bodily assumption of Mary. If Mary was conceived without sin, bore no sin, and lived her entire life without sin, then there was no need for her to undergo decay in the grave. Her body didn't need to die. Instead, she was taken up into heaven and remains embodied there. <clears throat> now, what is tradition with a lowercase t? When we as Protestant Christians... There we go. When we as Protestant Christians think of tradition... We're instead talking about something different. Tradition with a lowercase t is informed by wisdom that belongs to us from the past, but this kind of tradition doesn't consider the past as binding. The role of tradition is to qualify, I'm sorry, clarify and discern scripture. Scripture still remains the ultimate authority. So again, I mentioned before we're going to look at biblical theology, systematic theology, and historical theology to explain the differences between the three. So but before we look at historical theology, first we're going to start with biblical theology. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So what is biblical theology? Biblical theology looks at Scripture broadly and reminds us that God does not give us the Bible all at once. Instead, God progressively reveals himself and his ways to his people over the course of time. Think, for example, of how God, how the people of God worshiped God. In the Pentateuch, we read the, of the patriarchs constructing altars. That kind of worship gave way to what we now have in the tabernacle for God. Next, we find God's people worshiping him in the temple. First, the original temple and the second temple. In the New Testament, we learn that Jesus Christ became incarnate and dwelled among us like the temple of God. And Jesus places emphasis on the specific location of worship 
and more emphasis on the need to worship God in spirit and truth. So in this example, we can see a development of God's revelation of himself. And in this way, biblical theology informs our theology of worship by reminding us that God has revealed his truth over time. Biblical theology also helps us understand that the center of God's revelation has always been his son, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament anticipates the coming of Christ. The New Testament looks back at the Christ who has come. Biblical theology helps emphasize the Christological center of all of Scripture. So next, systematic theology. What is systematic theology? Well, it raises and answers the questions, what are we to believe and do today in accordance with all that the Bible affirms on any particular topic? It means answering the question, what does the Bible say to us today about a certain topic? Pretty straightforward. In other words, it means searching through the Bible into all the verses, all the themes, all the contexts that pertain to a certain topic of study. Then we put them together to gain an understanding of what God <clears throat> wants us to believe. I understand that the word systematic to mean carefully organized by topics. This means it's different <clears throat> from random theology or disorganized theology. Now we're going to look at historical theology. What is historical theology? How does that fit in? Historical theology lies behind both biblical and systematic theology, and it lies behind. It's behind those kind of in the background, right? But really, this is how we start to see how all these things come together throughout the church, throughout church history. It's a very, it's a supporting role. So again, it doesn't deal directly with scripture. It supports those disciplines of systematic theology and biblical theology. It's, a, it's an aid. It provides context and synthesis. And there's six benefits of historical theology we're going to look at. Mm -hmm. oh, doesn't capture all that, the... Okay. So six benefits of historical theology. So number one, historical theology helps us distinguish orthodoxy from heresy. Those are loaded terms, so let's define them. Orthodoxy is sound doctrine. It's the doctrine the church is bound to believe because this doctrine represents the teachings of all of Scripture. Now, heresy is anything that contradicts sound doctrine. It either misrepresents Scripture, ignores Scripture, or incorrectly puts Scripture uh, together. Historical theology looks to the past to understand how previous generations have defined some doctrines as orthodox and others as heretical. Our second benefit, historical theology provides examples from the past to guide us today, an example of what not to do, which is really what is very helpful. In the fourth century, Athanasius argued for the full deity of Christ. He stood against other Christians who insisted that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was not fully God. Obviously, we believe he is. So at this point, we see that there was a major controversy that this doctrine was being developed through. Now, again, it's obvious to us, we don't really debate it within, uh, within our circles. We do with, with what we call um, cults and that kind of thing, but obviously this was a time where it was developing within the church, within the church. And so we don't really spend a lot of time defending it. But in his time, in Athanasius' time, that wasn't the case. He was exiled five times, five times for standing firmly on the deity of Christ. The theology he expressed and the risk he took to express it constitutes only one of many examples of courage and perseverance that historical theology provides for us today. Number three, historical theology protects us from individualism. We live in an age that desires to try to find new and novel things. Historical theology reminds us that we are part of a community that holds the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Historical theology tells us that we as individuals can't pick and choose what we want to believe and what we don't want to believe. It protects us from a lone ranger version of Christianity. Number four, historical theology helps us to focus on the essentials of the faith. It reminds us that churches have always believed certain key cardinal doctrines. This means we, as the church today, should also focus on these most important matters. And studying historical theology helps us discern what these matters are. Here's a few of them. Scripture is the inspired, authoritative, true word of God. God is eternally existing as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, the Son, is fully God and fully man. The Holy Spirit is fully God and operates in our sanctification. The church is the people of God, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we have hope in Christ for life after our death, Christ's return, and our resurrection. 
So the study of historical theology grounds us further in these core matters of the faith. Point five, excuse me. Historical theology provides assurance that Jesus Christ is building his church. It reminds us that Christ is fulfilling his promise in Matthew 16, which says, on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus continues to build his church in many ways. And historical theology assures us that Jesus Christ, as he did in the past, continues to build his church by helping us to understand the Bible correctly and formulate our doctrines soundly. And our last point, number six, historical theology connects the church of today and the church of all ages. It gives us a sense of rootedness in the past of our faith. It helps us discern what it means to be the church today. If Athanasius, Augustine, or Luther were to be transported through time to the church today, they would recognize, they would recognize great continuity between the church of their time and the church in ours. Studying historical theology reminds us that we are rooted in a long-standing tradition. So that ends our introduction to what historical theology is. Now this next portion, I'm really going to now get into the meat of what we're going to be going through. <clears throat> So, course objectives. So this class specifically will examine the development of the doctrine of God, its essence and attributes, and the Trinity starting from the birth of the church up to our modern era. It's kind of a very, um, uh, what do you call it, specific treatment of it. A lot of historical theology will look at all the various doctrines that develop, but uh, this course is going to look specifically at this. I think it's probably because it is it was the central element in developing uh, our doctrines that we have today, our doctrine of God, uh, Trinity, the Holy Spirit, um, Christ. And so I think it's probably one of the most important and one of the most that so many get wrong. And that's why it's, it really, it took hundreds of years to develop the doctrine of the Trinity that we have and affirm today. So we're going to look at key figures uh, throughout church history who contributed to our understanding of God and the Trinity, forged through a deep reflection on Scripture, God's nature, and the Gospel. The doctrine of God and the Trinity are mysterious doctrines. So we'll be learning a theological grammar, if you will, developed and deployed in the early church, period. And I have handouts for these. Those of you online, I guess you're without them. Sorry. <clears throat> but sharpened through heretical conflict, these terms and concepts are foundational to how a discourse about God in a manner that is grounded in Holy Scripture. And as we say here at Sovereign Way, orthodoxy shapes orthopathy and leads to orthopraxy. So again, this first lecture, we're going to cover a few key things. We're going to look at what I call contemplating the incomprehensible God, the essence of God in Revelation, God's language of creation, and then we'll have questions at the end. <clears throat> so this is my second introduction. <clears throat> The triune God has revealed himself in creation, in Holy Scripture, and most gloriously in the person of Jesus Christ. The incomprehensible God of the universe decided to speak. The infinite became finite, so that the finite could know the infinite. In a divine moment without parallel, the uncreated brought created being into existence with time and space. His purpose? To have loving fellowship with creatures he created for his glory, to perfect them after the image of his beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, bringing them to fulfillment according to his purpose for them. The late theologian John Webster writes that God's triune revelation in time and space, his divine works, works at extra, repeat or externalize God's imminent being. Again, these are terms that you're probably hearing that I shouldn't know, but we're going to talk through those. This is what we call God in se. In se, in se means in himself. Ad extra means outside of himself. Creatures have no window into the divine essence. Not even Moses was able to see more than the back of God, whatever God's back might be. There is no creaturely way to apprehend the direct essence of God. However, we need to engage in discourse about him. But how do we engage in discourse regarding a reality in which nothing we say correlates directly to it? The purpose of God's external works is to lift our hearts minds, and souls up to gaze on the beauty of the Lord all the days of our lives, as you read in Psalm 27.4. But we need to have a divine grammar so we can attempt to contemplate his beauty, nature, character, attributes, and purpose. What words can describe the essence of God? What conceptual framework allows us to speak of God in a manner that adequately extols his glory and keeps us from breaking the first and second commandments? <clears throat> 
This was the greatest challenge for the early church writers, to articulate a conceptual theologia, which is a study of God, about the God of the Bible, while remaining grounded in the biblical text. In his monumental work, The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God, The Arian Controversy in 318 to 381, R.P.C. Hansen captures the issue at hand. He says, quote, The theologians of the Christian church were slowly driven to a realization that the deepest questions which face Christianity cannot be answered in purely biblical language because the questions are about the meaning of biblical language itself, end quote. For early Christian theologians, discourse in language about God's essence could not be formulated in a comparative or competitive manner contrastive to contingent reality as the pagan modes of religion. I know that's a mouthful, but we'll talk through that. God is not like creatures. Therefore, our expressions, our first principles, of, principles about God, have to ensure that distinction guides our discourse. There's God and there's creatures. So where do we begin? For the early church, and notably for Augustine, that journey began at the burning bush of Exodus 3.14. Exodus 3 records the details of Moses' calling, where God reveals himself to him in a flame of fire on a burning bush at Mount Horeb. Moses saw the bush on fire and was astonished that it was not burning up. And as he got closer to the burning bush, God called out to him, quote, Remove your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Exodus 3, 5. God then tells Moses that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and that he has heard his people's cries and is going to deliver them from their oppressors. Therefore, he's going to send Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. But Moses asks a question. He says, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. God identifies himself in three names, Elohim, Hayah, and Yahweh. What do these names mean? In the Hebrew, I am is Hayah. And it's a verb, not a noun. And connecting it to the name Lord, it becomes Yahweh, or in a syllabic form, Yahweh. But the verb, Haya, simply means to be, or to have the quality of being. And Elohim, it just means for God. It speaks to the, the what or the nature of the Lord, as the uncreated supernatural being who created the cosmos, who rules and governs, governs it. He is the object of worship for the Israelites. Yahweh the personal name of God appears 6,828 times in the Old Testament, and it is God's name forever. It is the personal name of the covenant God, who is not only the transcendent creator of all things, but he is the imminent deity who has made a people for himself for his glory. And it is this name that becomes the foundation of all theology. Yahweh functions as the starting point of man's contemplation on the divine nature and the character of the God of this universe the creator of heaven and earth, who has revealed himself to us in his creation. Now, pagan notions of deity was, was widespread, but in the revealing of I am to Moses, humanity is a starting place to begin conceptualizing a who and what understanding of God. We're talking about contemplation. The Lord's manifestation of the burning bush reveals many interesting facts about God. Moses already mentioned his astonishment that the fire did not consume the bush. How does fire not consume a bush? How does a fire continue to burn without burning up a physical source needed to keep the fire burning? How does a voice manifest itself from a fire that does not have vocal cords? In this scenario, we have philosophical and metaphysical challenges to explain what God is. Man's ability to comprehend and describe that nature and being of God becomes the aim in man's desire to relate to an infinite God who is. In part three, we're going to be talking about theological metaphysics. So due to our limitations as creatures, our language to describe God is limited as well. 
We all operate under a set of presuppositions when it comes to seeing and describing what and how the world is. And these presuppositions carry over into what I call God talk. When we try to describe what is real, we are engaging in metaphysics. So metaphysics is a branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of reality of what is real. Metaphysics means beyond or after physics, physics being nature. I always think of it as trying to describe what is behind the mask of what we see and know and experience. So when it comes to describing God, we are attempting to make inroads into the true nature of divinity. While the finite cannot fully comprehend the infinite, we can grasp some truths about God and the character of God through revelation. And within the study of describing what is real, we enter into the study of being, B-E-I-N-G, being. Sounds like it says being, but it's B-E-I-N-G. Or what the actual term is, is called ontology, which is also closely related uh, to uh, metaphysics. Again, both are attempts at understanding what is real with being as the basic level of our metaphysical reality, what's ultimately behind what we see. However, not everyone holds to the same metaphysical understanding. And as we will see, a great metaphysical shift from the long-standing tradition of Christian orthodoxy led to the rethinking of the doctrine of God in modern Western Christianity. What makes theological inquiry and discourse challenging is that we are trying to describe and understand a spiritual reality of God who is spirit, exists eternally, is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. We are physical creatures. We are a psychosomatic unity. We are body and spirit, and God is spirit. So when reading scripture, the spiritual reality communicated to us is steeped in metaphor. Metaphor becomes the copula to communicating spiritual truths. Copula is the grammatical name to describe the linking verb is. Jesus is Lord. The copula is the linking verb. Brian is human. So in saying that God is light, what does that communicate about God? Now, metaphors can run amok when interpreters of Scripture absolutize a metaf metaphorical depiction of God, making it what we call the root metaphor of one's entire concept of God. For example, the, the Bible presents God as creator, judge, savior, Lord, father, king, love, light, truth, just to name a few. Now, the danger is letting one's personal experience of God function as the foundation and lens through which one sees God and interprets, it, interprets scripture. This would be a root metaphor which can actually become idolatrous. A root metaphor shapes and guides an interpreter's hermeneutic because it functions underneath the full consciousness of the worldview level and defines what is considered axiomatic, valuable, and criteriological. For example, if one latches onto God as a parental figure, as a, for example, as the tendency of what we call open relational theism, we'll talk about that more, but God as a parental figure, one tends to interpret passages about God's nature, character, and divine activity in that light. And therefore, what happens is the interpreter tends to downplay or avoid biblical texts that contradict or, or bear great tension on the God as parent metaphor. And the result is a lopsided view of God and that of the redemptive story presented in Scripture. So to avoid metaphorical ambivalence, the interpreter must test his own presuppositions with the primary doc documents of his faith, Holy Scripture. And he must reflect upon the different presuppositions of others who have come before him and surround him. Now, theological metaphysics plays a central role in what we think about God and what we say about him. In fact, all interpreters of scripture make decisions based on a theological metaphysic. Now, a theological metaphysic, then, is, is the reality one sees when it comes to the nature and being of God. Craig Carter's definition is instructive. He says, theological metaphysics is the account of the ontological nature of reality that emerges from the theological descriptions of God in the world found in the Bible. We all have metaphysical presuppositions. The goal is to let the scripture shape them. Now, classical theism is going to be a term you're going to hear quite often. Um, it is what we would say as Protestant Christians that we are classical theists. And those doctrines that are associated with classical theism are the omnis, the omnipresent, omniscient, um, um, aseity, omnipotent, all of these kind of uh, ones that speak about God in, in, in negative attributes, and we'll talk about that later on too.
But classical theism has a philosophical foundation that it grounds in biblical exegesis. And it is theological metaphysics that more accurately represents this relationship. <clears throat> For example, in John's prologue, it's a very helpful um, example to look at what I'm talking about. So in John 1, 1 through 18, when John writes that the word was with God and is God, having created all things, designating the word is not part of the created order, we are tasked with conceptualizing a metaphysical reality that the word comes from. Excuse me. Get back to the right slide. <laughs> no, we're not there yet. Okay. And then when John says that in him, in the word, was life, serious ontological implications follow that are antithetical to a material understanding of the world. This was Augustine's dilemma in the early days when moving from Manichaeism to Christianity. Now, Manichaeism lacked an ontological conception of God that made a distinction between God and the material universe. It was thought that the physical reality was evil and the spirit reality was good and pure and true. And we call this cosmic dualism. However, it created an ontological paradox. The problem for Augustine was trying to conceive of God as both real and also as not in any way part of the material universe. Remember, I said at the very beginning, there's God and there's creatures, and he's distinct from us, but how is God real then? And that's what Augustine was struggling with. But it was not until he came to understand through Platonism the concept of a spiritual substance that his exegesis then had a platform on which to stand. He could now say that God is a real thing, a spiritual substance, but not a material thing like the created universe, like this tree, like this rock. Now, we use the rock in the Bible, metaphorically speaking, but God can no, no means be a rock. However, Platonic thought only enabled him to perceive of God from afar. Holy Scripture revealed the, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> Holy Scripture revealed the triune God manifested as Father, Son, and Spirit. Scripture revealed the glorious Christ as fully God, entering his own creation, taking on flesh, dying in the flesh, and being resurrected by the eternal spirit in glory. If there is no ontological distinction between God and the universe, such words are meaningless. Only a God who is a spiritual substance could be perfect, immutable, and eternal, thus establishing the basis for Augustine's and what we call the great tradition of classical theism, his theological metaphysics. Now, strands of modern theology operate under a different metaphysic than that of the great tradition of confessional classical orthodoxy. The great tradition, as you will hear described, the tradition that unites exegesis, metaphysics, and dogma is found in the early church, reaching its end with John Calvin. This tradition's metaphysical foundation is, the Christian, is that of Christian Platonism, most notably known in the works of Augustine. Now, Christian Platonism is not I would say accepted wholesale in the tradition. There's some critics because of how it seems like we're just taking uh, Greek philosophy and, and melding it into the Christian faith, um, but that's not the case, and there's a lot of discussions about that, and we will work through that as we go through this course. But I'm gonna cite Craig Carter again. He says, Christian Platonism was developed in order to express the metaphysical implications of the doctrine of God that emerged from the pro-Nicene scriptural exegesis in the fourth century, and as a result, the exegesis the dogma or the doctrine, and the metaphysics are all intertwined together. And as we will see, metaphysics cannot be ignored without exegesis and doctrine being negatively affected. The theological metaphysic of the early church as dominantly manifested in the, August, the Augustinian Thomistic, Thomistic theological tradition was arrived at through contemplation of God's special revelation in Holy Scripture. Again, remember, I'm looking at various contributors throughout the church history such as Augustine, we'll get to Thomas Aquinas much later, but we're going to look at how all of them, in a sense, contributed to this classical tradition. But the work of the Holy Spirit needs to guide our thinking and shaping of doctrine. And we must always put philosophy in its proper place as the hand mated to our theology. Philosophy helps make our theology actually very strong, but theology ultimately is the governor of our views of Scripture, of God, and Christ. Part four, God's language of creation, Romans 1, 19 through 20. Paul's introduction in, in his letter to the church in Rome lays bare the fact that God's wrath is stored up for all mankind. God's wrath is just because humanity, whom God made for himself, has rejected its maker. 
All of humanity is ungodly. Humanity has suppressed the knowledge of God, even though God has made himself clearly known. In fact, he has shown himself to them, Romans 1.19. And Paul makes it clear what God has done to reveal himself, right? His invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. It's important to see that. We obviously cannot see God. We can't see his eternal power as a, as a material or his nature, but we've, says, we've clearly seen that since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. So what does that tell us? It tells us our creation that's before us points to a God, the God, that has all power and all um, sovereignty over everything. He is the creator. And as a result, because of what's around us to see, Paul says people are without excuse. The rejection began after the fall in the garden and continues to pervade the hearts and wills of every man, woman, and child. The power of sin keeps humanity in bondage to godlessness and idolatry, to which the scripture says God has given mankind over, Romans 1.24, resulting in every human being bearing the penalty of death and eternal destruction. But in looking back at how God has revealed himself, Paul writes that God revealed his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature to humanity through what he has created, the material reality in which all created beings and things exist. Thus, we can know something about God through cause and effect. So what does it mean to say one is divine and eternal? The grammar of Paul's statement demonstrates that God's invisible attributes are his eternal power and divine nature. The Greek word for invisible is erotos, which means not being subject to being seen, unseen, invisible, ultimately of God. So he who is invisible, God, he made himself clear to humanity, to humanity kind of an oxymoron. So that, why? They would have a knowledge of his divine nature and eternal power. The invisible creator brings about a visible creation so that he can be clearly perceived. John Calvin writes, quote, God is in himself invisible, but as his majesty shines forth in his works and in his creatures everywhere, men ought in these to acknowledge him, for they clearly set forth their maker, end quote. So while we have all fallen into sin because of Adam, every person is without excuse because he willingly rejects the truth of God and therefore he is accountable. It is important to see that God has made himself known and yet he's incomprehensible. And in what he manifested to us, we are able to formulate a manner of talking about the nature and being of God. And I will get into that in more detail later. But a few key texts that speak about the divine nature will function as our backdrop as we move forward into the development of the church's language about God's essence. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you can't see it all. It's kind of cut off. But anyways, okay. So from Holy Scripture, the church has described God as spirit, John 4, 24, as eternal, Psalm 90, verse 2. He's immutable, Psalm 102, verse 20, 26. Omnipresent, Jeremiah 23, 24. Omniscient, Psalm 147, 5. Omnisapient, which means all wise, Romans 16, 27. Omnipotent, Job 26, 15. Holy, Exodus 15, 11. All good, Mark 10, 18. Omnibenevolent, which means all loving, 1 John 4, 8. In sovereign over his creation, Psalm 103, 19. Now, these are just a, just a sampling of passages to support these description of God. And we will identify more as we move through our study of the nature and being of God. Now, other important aspects of discussion pertain to the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and the deity of the Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, yet there are three who the Scripture attributes with the full divinity of God. So how is Jesus fully God and fully man? Is the Spirit a person or a force? The 4th century was a turbulent time for the church in that it was constantly involved in heated doctrinal discussion with eternal significance. Now, the trajectory of our excursion begins with the New Testament church to then traverse through the prominent early church fathers, concluding our study with Cyril of Alexandria. We will look at the development of terms and identify the shift in conceptual thought about the essence of God and how it was deployed in theological discourse.
Modern critics claim the early church fathers veered off from the biblical text into a speculative land foreign to a Christian doctrine of God. They say that they were Hellenized, and we will get into that into our next lesson. Thank you all for watching tonight. I hope it's helpful. We will see you next time.